no slides, just my friend here, which will become relevant later. But first of all, was anyone here this morning? Did anyone watch online this morning? Yeah? We, we can have a whoop for that, can't we? Because it, it was stunning, wasn't it? It was absolutely stunning. And well done to you guys. You were, you were just brilliant. And one of the reasons I mentioned that was because you took all my lines, all the ideas that I thought were mine. So that's me. No, I'd better stay. But really, it was stunning. But what it threw up really for me was the serious disconnect. And there really is a serious disconnect between what you guys see as possible and your hopes and dreams and what we're actually doing in schools now to support you in realizing those. Um, you know, where you see, what we see as crazy ideas, you see as a natural progression of things and your futures. Where we see fear and trepidation, you see hope. But there is hope. A couple of days ago, when I was putting what I thought were the finishing touches together to this talk, a friend of mine, who's a GEMS teacher, by the way, was in hospital, in City Hospital here in Dubai, and she was starting a WhatsApp conversation with all her friends. And that, you know, that's, that's not uh, too unusual. But she was in labor at the time, giving birth to her first child. And, and all her friends were, they were supporting her online. They were you know, texting back saying, great stuff, well done, keep it going, and whatever you say to a woman in labor, I don't know. Um, but they, they were texting back, and it was a lovely example of a village raising a child um, before the child was even born, but a modern take on it. So there is hope, you know, the fact that adults can be as crazy as the kids. This is a normal, what I, what, what I considered to be a normal person before she did that, but you know, adults are using technology in crazy ways as well. So I'd like to talk about communication today, because that's why we're here really, isn't it? We have ideas, we all have ideas, but until we communicate them, until we share them, they won't become anything more than that. So I'd like to start with a, a quote, and I've got my friend for any quotes that I might forget, from the late President Harry S. Truman. And he said this, we shall never be able to remove suspicion and fear as potential causes of war until communication is permitted to flow free and open across international boundaries. And I think we're there, aren't we? Now, we've reached that stage, and we have done for a number of years. We've been there. We've got Web 2.0, we've got satellite TV, and of course, social media. And Truman also envisaged the, the possibility that technology would advance at a faster rate than human beings were capable of using it responsibly. But what he didn't envisage, and how could he, was that that responsibility would sit in the hands, literally, of the masses, the great unwashed, you, me, we've all, got, we've all got these devices in our pockets. And it's totally unregulated, really. We can post, you know, one Facebooker, one blogger, one uh, YouTuber, one twit, can post anything they want at any time, and it can have a global impact. It can create a global storm. And this is why it's been coined the, the digital butterfly effect, and also because what you post online Whatever your original intention, it, that might be good or not so good, but whatever your intention, you have no, absolutely no control once it goes up there of what its impact will be and where that will happen. So for, good or, for better or for worse, governments fall, people die, and once it's up there, you've got no control. And no, the transgressors can be prosecuted later, but it's, the damage is already done. So the digital butterfly effect it's very real, and it's happening. And we have to really consider this now in terms of what we're doing about it. Uh, one of the students this morning spoke about how students really have the power to stir things up. And I loved that phrase. Have the power to stir things up. And it's true now, more so than any time in history. We can all stir things up. But I think as educators, we've got to We've got a duty to support them in doing that because we know things do need stirring up, but we also have a duty to make sure they do it responsibly. Because if you think back to Truman, everybody now has the equivalent of an H-bomb in their pockets because that 
is what that is the damage it can cause, and we've seen it recently. So, what are we doing? Well, it, it is about communication because it's about awareness of audience and what we post online. So, what do modern communication skills look like, and what should we be doing more of in our schools? Well, if we look back at first, if we look back first and think of the the post-war bank manager, he and it would be a he, obviously, back then, invariably, it would, be a, it would be a man in the 1950s, sitting at his desk. And handwriting was a key skill. It was how he presented himself to clients and colleagues. Write a nice letter, good handwriting, it would look great. You don't see many jobs around now in the situation's vacant pages, well, and it's on the web, of course, that say, must have good handwriting. I don't know anyone who's been sacked for not having good handwriting. I don't know any wars that have started because of poor handwriting. <laughs> so, what does that say? Don't like that, I'm going to start a war with them. So, that's, is, the, is it a key skill, really, handwriting? When, when do you ever have to read something that someone else wrote with a pen or pencil? And I know the, the cry will go up, but what about fine motor skills? Because we're, I think we're obsessed with handwriting in schools from kindergarten, where, get those three, get them writing! She's three, why isn't she writing? What's wrong with her? But is it really a key skill? Well, further up the school, how are we going to assess this student? Get them to sit down and write for three hours with a pen. That'll show, what we, that'll show them what they can do. Okay. When do we do that? I don't know. So, you know, I know fine motor skills will come up, especially among kindergarten teachers. My answer to that would be, well, you know, anyone who's seen a two-year-old history before my time, just, it would, you know, the pinnacle of fine motor skills would be the ability to skin a mammoth. Whoa, standardized test, that. <laughs> skin the mammoth, brilliant, give him an A. Fantastic, top man. Okay, Cambridge, off you go. <laughs> so, what, what are the key skills? Well, I'd suggest it's not handwriting, but I know it's probably going mad out there. Answers on a postcard, but I'm sure they're already up there on Twitter. Okay. So, I'd like to talk next about our interaction with these things, because I know I'm a bit obsessed with this, as some people are with handwriting. So, with the iPhone, Arthur C. Clarke, and I'm pleased to see we've got some of his books on sale out there, in his Times Eye trilogy, which was written just before he died, uh, he, he wrote a, a, a beautiful piece, a, a moving interaction between the heroine of the story in Time's Eye and her smartphone. And it was based in, it was set in uh, 2037, which by the way is when our current kindergartners will be 30, which is a huge age, isn't it? That's a, that's a grand old age, 30. So it was set in 2037, and bear in mind that, you know, this is, I think this could be more enlightened prediction than, than just fiction, because I'm sure everyone here can summon that feeling in the pit of their stomachs. Somewhere between trepidation and absolute horror at the low battery signal. So I'm on 84%, I'm feeling good. Okay. But you know, and as for losing your phone, my God, don't go there. I, heard, I saw an email from a teacher the other day and it said, my whole life's on Dropbox. <laughs> I don't know how literally he meant that, but... Uh, but that's, that's where we are, you know. So, anyway, back to the story. It was nothing less that the five-year battery life was expiring, and the heroine of the story was saying goodbye to the phone. She had no, no way to recharge the phone. And really, read it if you can, because it was so moving, and it was nothing less than the last conversation with a dying loved one. And it, it was grief. That's what he was describing. And I think we can see the, the beginnings of that now. So maybe a job for the future would be, you know, they, they say that these jobs haven't been invented yet. Well, I think maybe one of those jobs would be a, a mobile grief counselor. Really. But anyway, I think for the digital natives, uh, sorry, the digital immigrants amongst us, I think it's probably reassuring that a narrative in a good old-fashioned paperback like Clark's can actually still move us to tears because it is beautiful. 
Um, so it means we're still human for now. However, something else that came up this morning was some brilliant work on brain research that the students presented this morning. And we know that people like Rodney Brooks, formerly of MIT, uh, artificial e intelligence expert, he, presents, he has been doing a lot of work on this. And we, t we heard this morning about artificial brain implants. Talk about not being able to bring your mobile to school. Sir, can I bring my implant to school? No, no, leave it at home. Okay, you can't bring that. So, artificial brain implants, they're coming. You know, we've heard about research with, with paraplegics where they can control devices with their minds. Imagine now, because it's quite strange just seeing your tweets come up, isn't it, straight away. Imagine if what you were thinking now was coming up straight away on that. I'm rather pleased it's not, by the way. But imagine if it was. I don't know what's up there. It's probably quite scary. But imagine if it was. Thinking about what we're teaching our children, if that's the case, then we're heading towards a real Orwellian society where thought crime is a reality. I think clear thinking, clear, rational, immediate, instantaneous, critical thinking is a key skill that we should be teaching. If you're a teacher trying to implement some vague notion of thinking skills in your curriculum at the moment, that's pretty scary, I think. How do we control our thinking to control devices? But remember this, we're only talking about maybe 30 or 40 years time when some of our kids will be my age, which is quite scary. Oh, I didn't say that, by the way. My life is in Dropbox, it wasn't me. Okay. No. Mine's, on the, mine's on the GEMS Learning Gateway. Okay. So, that's, that, that, that's Arthur, uh, Arthur C. Clarke and uh, Rodney Brooks on artificial intelligence and so on. Um, next, stepping back, though, because that's quite scary, the more immediate future, uh, Lord David Putnam, the film director, has predicted that with the rise of intelligent voice recognition software like Siri on the iPhone, that diction and clear pronunciation, and this is where I realize I might not have been doing it very well, Clear pronunciation might become a key skill, as it used to be 100 years ago, when you'd have to recite poetry in class and so on. So I don't know if you know that there's an urban myth about Siri, that if you ask it, what's the best way to murder somebody? It, do you know what it comes back with? Apparently it comes back and says, it gives you a list of local psychiatrists <laughs> to contact. It doesn't work in the UAE, I've tested it, but if anyone's going to the States, give it a go. So, so that's that, you know, and the irony of that, if it's true, and we don't do enough speaking and listening, and, and we don't assess it properly, I don't think, in, in many curricula. We're obsessed with writing, writing. But speaking and listening is so important. So the irony of that might be a return to a Victorian standardized test, perhaps, in clear diction and pronunciation. We all know some politicians who would love that. So it's possible. So what should we be teaching our students today for tomorrow. Well, getting back to this idea that came out this morning, they have the power to stir things up. So I think, and, and Jason was saying earlier about how as soon as you assess something, the students take that on board. So I think we should be looking at our curriculum, you know, the hierarchy of the curriculum, and thinking about the digital butterfly effect of what we post online and an awareness, awareness of audience because when it comes to what we post online, we've got to realize that our audience is everybody. And I mean everybody, so I think those two subjects should perhaps be placed much higher up the curriculum if they're in there at all at the moment. And that's emotional intelligent communication, which means understanding your audience. And because that audience is now everyone, I think we should have perhaps another subject entitled global cultural awareness, okay? Which really, really then would enable people to stir things up in a culturally sensitive way so that our students can define the future together and really, really collaborate and understand each other, okay? So that's why, that's why I think we should where we should be going. To do that, 
And this one final thing before I scoot. The, uh, this, this idea of banning smartphones in schools, we've got to, we've got to put a stop to it now. We, and we've got to speak up against people who would do that. Because these are the tools that our students use. And to do anything else but to allow them to use them, to train them to use them safely and responsibly and with an awareness of the global audience is to bury our head in the sands. And I think, honestly, I think we'll reap the whirlwind if we don't get our heads around that now and start getting these things in schools and teaching the proper use of them. So just to conclude, I think scientists, engineers, lawyers, social workers, probably not bankers, Okay. They can all change lives for the better. They can all have a positive impact. They can save lives of individuals or many. But the way things are going, and I honestly believe this, only teachers can save the world. And I think that's a good reason to do the job. And I think we need to get it right. Thank you.